So if we could just go back to your interests in lean mass hyperresponders and the questions that you have, how do you plan on answering them? Well, you know, with, what is your hypothesis essentially and how are you going to test that? So it's, it's just really two questions. There's two questions of enormous interest. The first one is the nerdy one, which is the mechanistic explanation for this triad, particularly for this phenotype that's at the center of the research. That one's quite complex. Been working with a lot of folks, including many that you're going to be interviewing ultimately, but uh, that's really not the one that probably most people are watching as closely or even understand as well. The second one is what everyone's interested in, the question of risk. Are lean mass hyperresponders at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease? Now, th this is the thing that I think um, is great because we'll be able to get around to something both Dr. Cromwell and I have enormous <laughs> overlap with, which is that ApoB and LDL are certainly very interesting. They're very interesting. Metabolic health is probably one of the most gigantic blind spots you can imagine in healthcare today, even for as much as it's getting talked about. It's not getting talked about enough. It's not getting focused on enough, right? Okay, but bringing it back to LDL ApoB, I think that even a lot of non-low-carb physicians in the scenario of a lean mass hyperresponder who has, let's say, an LDL of even as much as 200, Eight years ago, that would be absolutely outrageous. Today, I'm actually surprised at how many people, clinicians outside of the low-carb community have gotten surprisingly a little bit more permissive about that if everything else looks great. But then you get to somebody who has an LDL of 400 or 500 or 600. Now we're talking Brown and Goldstein's children who were developing atherosclerosis at an extremely rapid rate. Why would anybody leave their LDL at 500, 600, et cetera, especially when we've already published papers leveraging the lipid energy model showing just a very modest reintroduction of carbs, which we won't get into the mechanisms here, can bring that down to the levels we just now talked about, like 200, which again, still seems outrageous, but to many would still be more permissible than being at the 500, 600, and so forth. Well, some folks have truly diseases like say epilepsy where they really do need to keep their carbs that low some that we've interviewed for the documentary we're doing uh, are treating say bipolar need to be that low we also interviewed a prominent low carb doctor in the uk who uses it to manage her food addiction which is quite severe and so those three examples that i've just mentioned it's not uncommon for them to come from the perspective that you just, we couldn't know what a difference in the quality of life is for them and what the risks are for the converse. So we need to get this data, not just for those that have even mildly elevated LDL, but those who have it at those levels to at least see if it's not just a, an increase of cardiovascular disease, but it's that high magnitude of change. That should come through in the data that we're getting right now, particularly with CT and geography. Earlier, I think you kind of emphasized that, at least with the genetic data, the PCSK9 loss of function, you're not convinced there's an improvement in mortality. Uh, but I think you accept that they have less atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, right? Yes. Again, I don't know if there's some version of a trade-off. I just don't know. Right. So... Why is it in this context of lean mass hyperresponder, and it, I might have this wrong, but it would kind of follow that your hypothesis would be they might have, they, they'll probably have increased plaque progression, but they're going to have lower risk of some other disease and their t total mortality is not going to be different. Well, this gets us back to the magnitude question. So the, the magnitude question is, Let's say I were to tell you, you have an increased risk of, of dying of a heart attack at age 95. But if you take steps A through Z, you'll have a reduced risk to where you'll be more likely to die of cardiovascular disease at age 100. Obviously, I'm using hyperbole to illustrate a point. 
that the risk level, relatively speaking, seems to be seems to be low, even though I'm talking about a difference of five years. But it's because of the time horizon is so different from what we're discussing. And if I throw in there, well, there's a trade-off. The trade-off is if you don't die of cardiovascular disease, you're more likely to die of cancer. And for whatever reason, I have absolute knowledge that that's what the trade-off in risk is. But how are you going to ascertain that in a very short-term study where you're looking at plaque? With, with plaque formation, with CT angiography? Yeah, CT how are you going to really ascertain whether there is that trade-off? Long. Oh, that's, that's very difficult to determine. But we can determine if there's rapid plaque progression short-term to at least determine if there's uh, that pronounced increase in risk. That's why I keep bringing it back to magnitude. See, I'm actually making a key concession here that's very important. For those people who are gonna be looking at this research that we're doing right now, and they may wanna make a categorical claim, I would already be pushing back on it, that we don't know if what you just said isn't true. That for example, somebody who exhibits a lean mass hyperspondyl phenotype has an LDL of 200 even, wouldn't be better off having a sweet potato a day and bringing their LDL to let's say 130 over 25 years, right? Because the magnitude of change is so small that it'd be difficult to pick up and say the study that we have. Right? Do you have any thoughts on that, Bill? Well, I would look at it a little differently. Uh, and that is that most lipidologists think of exposure over time, as Dave's saying. And because we encounter people who are high when we get them, we really don't know how long they've been that way. In some cases, people have medical records. A lot of times we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So you come to me and for whatever reason, your LDL is high. And I say, first question, I always ask my patients, how long has it been that way? I have no idea. So now we're left with a fill in the blank. Has it been a long time? Has it not been a long time? One way to try to answer that question is non-invasive imaging. And if we see plaque, we assume something is going on that has turned a process on that we would like to turn off. And part of understanding that is what else is going on and LDL-related risk turning that down. Now, in this case, we have people who were doing fine, apparently. They, they didn't have high LDL. They are metabolically not unhealthy. They seem to be metabolically healthy, at least a first impression. But didn't you say earlier, and I'm not trying to catch you out, that you had prediabetes? Correct. Right. So it wasn't as though you were starting with someone who had perfect metabolic health. Right. They adopted the diet. They, they may have had in poor this case, or um, not op, non-optimal metabolic health and then become. Right. An it's LMH an important person. distinction because, again, I, if we're looking at the big picture, I, I don't know who these folks are prior to their identification as, and I adopted keto and this happened to me. I, I don't know what their uh, history was to that point. So once they have now had this LDL response, what I would be very concerned about is it being high for a long time. That's my concern because the models of disease that we have say there's a consequence that we expect is likely for people who have high ApoB for a long period of time. And especially if you could adjust your macronutrient intake, reintroduce carbohydrates and bring that down to a more acceptable level, that would seem like a very reasonable thing to consider, especially if you have any evidence of, of plaque, right? But if you have a zero uh, evidence of plaque, either by CAC score or CTA, you're zero. Even if someone's younger, like in their 20s or 30s? Yeah, well, let's say you're zero. Okay, so we've looked and you're zero. And the point I'm trying to get to is if you have a high LDL that is new in the setting of no known disease, what is the time frame for that to assert itself? into plaque. I don't know the answer to that. I think if you give them 20 or 30 years, the expectation is it will drive atherosclerosis over some period of probable time. Is that five years? Is that 10 years? Is that two years? That time window is what- Brings it back to the magnitude question. Right. That brings it back to, we, we need to study these people sequentially to be able to answer that question. Yeah, like you could, you could tell me, given what I've come to understand is the total plaque score. You could tell me, I know for a fact, Dave, that um, your LDL concentration does mean something. That it's not an unknown in this hypothetical, but it is a known. 
you will add one total plaque score to your total plaque score over 50 years? I would say, oh, okay, well then that's, that's an easy answer, right? Because we've intentionally, I've intentionally created hyperbole for a 50 year time horizon to add one total plaque score. But now let's shift it up and say, no, in five years, you'll add 20 to your total plaque score out of a total score of 45. That's hyperbole in the opposite direction, right? The, the question that's difficult for us to answer and has been this entire time is how do you disentangle these clusters of the issues that we're talking about from the ApoB that's embedded within them, right? And for metabolic syndrome, that's, that's very difficult. The catalyst event that we were chatting about earlier and is still very present to all of us is the work of Brown and Goldstein with those who have homozygous FH. That is why we're so interested in lean mass hyperresponders at those super high levels at 400, 500, 600. Are they going to look comparable to those who have homozygous FH? That's what we're gathering data on In terms right of now. progression, plaque, Correct. and events? Yeah. Yes, both. Correct. Pla they correlate, of course, extremely close. So the presentation and progression of plaque, if ApoB is the central driver, should be what we would observe. And are you, both lean mass are you right? interested in looking at that in subjects who have no plaque at the onset of adopting a ketogenic diet when they sort of shift their phenotype to this lean mass hyperresponder phenotype? Well, of course, because that's, again, getting back to the children of Brown and Goldstein, there was the, the study that I mentioned that had the six children who, were, who had homozygous FH. I did the math on their milligram years, so on the cholesterol years. I don't have it in front of me, but I think I remember this from memory. I think it's, they had 14, I think the latest of the children that had not yet developed plaque, I think it was 1400 milligram years. And I think the earliest for which they did have plaque was 1800 milligram years. And the heuristic that um, I've seen you use as a graphic as well as many others has, and it's a heuristic, so it's not something you have to be held to exactly, is like around 5,000 milligram years. It's kind of like this red line, right? And it's a great, it's, it's great as an illustration for the amount over time, because the faster upward you're going, right? Presumably the faster you're going to show both the uh, presence of plaque and be at risk for an event and it becomes cumulative, right? It keeps doubling with each, I think, 1250 milligram years. Well, those children are getting it much, much earlier than 5,000 which goes to uh, Dr. Cromwell's point in that it is a different context, but already saying it's a different context is a little bit controversial because that is a cornerstone of the lipid hypothesis to begin with, that their levels are indicative of what the risk velocity is for cholesterol years. But I already know myself, a number of folks who are and have been at those levels, again, for medical reasons, typically because they're trying to treat some other disease. And, um, you know, while I say every, anything I say is not medical advice, I will tell you that folks I work with, like say Dr. Budoff, uh, Karam Nasir, they would be very much a fan of imaging. <laughs> so even if you're not in our study, it's not the worst idea if you could at least know how much disease you already have. Question for you, Bill. Let's say, someone in their mid thirties presents to you, they've adopted a ketogenic diet. They have an LDL cholesterol of 600, but otherwise healthy, great insulin sensitivity, metabolic health looks good. They have zero plaque, no family history of cardiovascular disease, and they don't have elevated LP little a. What's, what are you thinking in that context with regards to the management or uh, attention that you give to LDL cholesterol? I wouldn't want them to stay there. I would not want them to stay there. They're 30 years old. The longer they stay there, the more cumulative exposure risk they have. So number one is I'm not aware of an advantage of them staying there. I don't think they're benefiting themselves by a 300 cholesterol. So if I could adjust their macros, and I could bring their LDL down decidedly as 
uh, Nick and Dave and others have shown, you can adjust your macros and attenuate that increase. That would be my first step. And so you may be taking keto for a lot of great reasons. Um, I would wonder if you can continue to get those benefits by making a gentle adjustment in your carbohydrate intake, taking the pressure off that drove you to a 600. Let's get you down to something much more reasonable. See if you're getting the keto benefits you're looking for. And then we can have our next step conversation from there. And if they push back and said, look, doc, I understand what you're saying, but my symptoms, so they're bipolar, are better than they've ever been before. I'm not changing my diet or they've tried that and it didn't work. And I'm not familiar with the bipolar dietary intervention studies that are out there. So I can't off the top of my head, you know, tell you if there are other diets that are equally as beneficial or if it's been studied at all. But this is a hypothetical. I push back. I say, look, my N equals one anecdotal experience uh, is important to me. Mm -hmm. I feel significantly better in my relationships uh, with myself and others, mood, quality of life, I'm not going to change the foods I'm eating. Is that, are you recommending medications? I'm saying that I have no data in hand to suggest that a 600 LDL cholesterol doesn't have a negative consequence down the road. There is no data to show me that sustaining that level of LDL for an extended period of time is anything but risky. So I would knock that down with some type of a lipid lowering drug in that context if I was open to it. I, I would say that the, the hard conversation is we have to do one of three things. Number one, we leave you the way you are, and we follow you with some sort of imaging modality and wait for something bad to happen, atherosclerosis, and then attack it once we detect it. So one, one option is to say, if I ever find that I have disease, I'll revisit this conversation. But until I have disease, I'm not going to revisit this conversation for the reasons that you just said. That's one thing that a patient could do. A second thing a patient could do is they could say, uh, I'm willing to make subtle changes in my diet so long as I don't have uh, loss of benefit in the ways that you just described. And if by changing my diet subtly, by just reintroducing some carbs, knocks me down 200 points of my LDL, it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. I'm still getting the benefit that I'm looking for. And under those conditions, I will wait until I have a plaque and do something. That's a second uh, modification. The third is to say... Um, we don't want to expose you to an LDL of 600 needlessly. And if we have to have the keto diet as is currently practiced for the benefit that you're getting out of it, then I would strongly suggest treating that LDL pharmacologically. If we can't agree on some sort of therapeutic lifestyle change, dietary change, in order to lessen the impact of high LDL over time. Mm -hmm.